presented by the Golden Oldies. Um, if you missed them last week, they did their vintage fashion show. For those of you in the back, you're welcome to find a seat. Um, the vintage hat show will last about 35 minutes or so. Um, but um, like I said, you're welcome to have a seat. They're going to present a lot of fashions of hats or how to put them on and all those other details. We'll tell you more about it. Um, but you're welcome to have refreshments afterwards. And um, we hope you enjoy the show. And we're really happy that they are able to come again this weekend. Um, this is part of our collection education month. So the Lemay Family Collection Foundation will really focus on education. And what better way to get educated on vintage hats than by these ladies? Let's give him a round of applause. Let's get it started. Good afternoon. We are here to present 100 years worth of hat fashions. And what a venue we have. We get vintage cars. I hope that you've been able to enjoy seeing them as well. We are from the Golden Oldies Guild, a group that is affiliated with the Tacoma Goodwill. And we are happy to be here today. The Vintage Hat Collection has been assembled from community donations, and we always welcome new additions. If you have something special in the attic or in the trunk of, of your home, give us a call. Your gift will be cherished, well cared for, and enjoyed by audiences such as you. The income that we realize from this show, as well as the sale of your contribution of usable clothes, linens, furniture, books, and household items, stays within our own community. The income in it enables Goodwill to evaluate, train, and train and place people with disabilities and disadvantages in gainful positions of employment so that they too may become self-sufficient. Goodwill changes lives and communities by helping people go to work. Biblical patriarchs and later St. Paul decreed that a, model must, a modest woman must cover her hair lest its beauty tempt some weak male. Thus the hat was invented. Poor patriarchs, poor St. Paul. How did they know that the hat would soon become so lavish and so beautiful that it would be a hundred times more distracting than a mere head of hair? <laughs> How did they know that the urge to have a bigger, better, more fashionable hat than one's neighbor would fuel the millinery trade for centuries? Will men never learn? The collection you are about to see does not try to compete with museum collections. However, we do try to recreate the fads and fancies of fashions of yesteryear. Now, on with our show. Let's turn the clock back to... Let's turn the clock back to about 1865 when hoop skirts were in fashion. All respectable ladies were laced into corsets and high top boots, wore three and four petticoats, and of course, always wore a hat or a bonnet. They wore them to church. They wore them to tea. They wore them to go visiting. They even wore nightcaps to bed. This elegant little green velvet bonnet is perched regularly on Mary Dudley's head and was very much in fashion as the Civil War ended. The fashionable lady of the 1860s was shaped by forces Mother Nature never knew. Her torso was caged and laced into a canvas and whaleable corset with the 18-inch waist the admired ideal. Broken grips were not unheard of, and smelling salts were kept close at hand because she fainted a lot. It wasn't really a matter of sensibility. She couldn't breathe. Imagine driving in a hoop skirt and bonnet for one month in a stagecoach to get from New York to San Francisco. It wasn't very comfortable, was it, Mary Duffy?
replaced the hoop in the 1870s and 80s. Skirts hung straight in front and then swooped back over a horsehair pad or wire frame at the lady's rear to cascade gracefully to the floor. Hair fashion followed skirt fashion, with the hair drawn to the back into a cascade of curls or a slick chignon. Small hats trimmed with a variety of ribbons, bows, feathers, and fruit perched on the front of the head. Diane's black straw features plumes in champagne and bittersweet, which complement her small black cape. The winds of change were starting to blow during the 1880s as women began reaching for a more active life. A rather short-lived attempt by a few fashion rebels to simplify women's clothing and reduce the overabundance of trimmings did have one lasting result. The two-piece suit was born. It was known as the walking suit. In those days, there was no air extra dry and no dry cleaners on the corner. There was only grandma's life soap and the complexion soaps which women made in their own kitchens. Diane can attest that it wasn't easy to remain dainty. At the end of the 19th century, the well-turned-out lady laced her corset tightly enough to have a 19-inch waistline. Consequently, she carried a fan, for she often suffered from the vapors. Her gowns had enormous leg button sleeves, and she always wore a hat, like the one Mary Dudley shows. It's really for the birds. <laughs> Hats in this era were worn perched on top of the lock elaborate pompadour of their styles, and they often looked as though they could rise in flight at any time. In the 1890s, the growing needs of American business brought women into the workforce. Thanks to two recent inventions, they were finding new occupations. The typewriter had become the woman's tool, and the female secretary was born. And Alexander Graham Bell not only invented the telephone, he unwittingly created a female known as Sentra, who was immortalized in a song of that period. Hello, Sentra, give me heaven. It was a time when every manner and moral was prescribed by etiquette books, and marriage was the primary goal of every American woman. Mary Dudley has her eye on the very handsome young man next door. <laughs> get, you to the, get you to the church on time. Yes. Yeah, playing. She's already you're set up out in the in the area out there for her wedding. <laughs> the Gibson girl look was the look of youth at the turn of the century. It was the look of shirtwaist, skirts, and a flat pancake straw hat called a boulder. It was the new American girl look. Gibson girls were not content to occupy their time with teas and paying formal calls. Gibson girls loved sports and bicycling. They played croquet and tennis and badminton with enthusiasm. And they did it all, laced in a corset and wearing a hat, much like this one that Diane models. <laughs> Our early 20th century bathing beauty prided herself on her soft, bright complexion, and the idea of sun dating would have been unthinkable. Who wanted to look like a gypsy or a scrub woman? It was exciting and wonderful to live the freer and more energetic life of the new century, but it was still very important to be dignified, especially when playing badminton. That's a very dignified swing you have there, Diane. <laughs> Birds continued to adorn hats in the first years of the new century. And with the demand for egret plumes particularly hot, 
that bird nearly became extinct. Had the conservationists not intervened, we might have lost a few more species. Fortunately, there were plenty of ducks. Mary Dudley's hat was worn by a bride in 1902. Well, now she has her hat for her wedding. <laughs> That bride undoubtedly also wore the strange new corset, which forced her into, a, into an S-shaped posture. <laughs> Even her neck, neck was encased in a high, tight collar. A French woman who had studied anatomy and who was determined to release women from their bondage of lace and state body distortions designed a health, a health corset which had a straight front and supported the bosom from underneath. Women, instead of giving a sigh of relief, laced their new corsets so tightly that their bodies bent into an S shape. Nice women did not admit to using cosmetics, but pinching the cheeks to make them pink and dabbing a bit of rice powder to whiten the complexion, sure didn't count. I'll never, never tell Mary Dudley. That hat is not easy to stay on because it's so top heavy. So. so we just have to do like Mary Dudley and it's stayed on. Good. In 1980, Franz Lehar's Merry Widow opera was the smash hit on two continents, and the Merry Widow's plumed velvet hats with enormous brims became the smash hit of the millinery fashion world. What a fine balancing act Diane had to perform with a chapeau like this sailing atop her high pompadour. Windy days posed a real challenge Fortunately, she had her hat pins at the ready. Hostesses had to cut their guest list considerably to accommodate the room taken up by the Mary Widows. And theaters posted signs asking that ladies kindly remove your hat. Uh, Mary Dudley, Diane is on right now. Just mind your business. <laughs> What's happening here? <laughs> oh, ladies, ladies, behave yourselves. St. Paul would be ashamed of you. In 1908, when this hat was fashionable, an amazing process was created that was to change women's appearance more than anything else in history. A European, in, a European invented the permanent wig. 18 brave women in the United States had a permanent wig. It took 10 hours and it cost $1,000. Are you brave enough, Diane? Are you rich enough? No. <laughs> and in those days, 1908, that would be very expensive. It would be expensive now. Motoring became a fashionable recreation in the early years of the 20th century. Traffic laws proliferated as motor cars spat, smoked, trembled, and clattered. The new machines were an adventure and America loved them. The fashionable motoring hat is shown by Mary Dudley. It's a deep crowned black velvet hat draped with a pink chiffon scarf. She is appropriately all covered up. You see, few streets were paid and motoring was a dusty business. Now, Mary Dudley, you could pick a car here too that's sort of that way. Not, not too. When riding in an open car, the lady often used her parasol to protect herself from the elements. Those were the days when some women were watching the perils of Pauline at the movie house, and some women were living the perils while learning to drive these newfangled machines. The women thought that washing their hair more than once in 10 to 14 days would rob it of its essential oils and be injurious to its health.
health and beauty. 100 strokes a night with a good stiff brush was a ritual. What do you think, ladies? That hair washing schedule could save a lot of water and shampoo, but... <laughs> Happy motoring, Mary Dudley, and remember, don't go any faster than 10 miles an hour. Around 1910, the women of the Western world rose up and said, no more. They exchanged their steel bone corsets for a new garment, which conformed to their shape rather than the reverse. And they shed layers and layers of petticoats and other upholstery. The walking suit was all the rage, with its slim ankle-length skirt. Shocking, women had ankles? and its body-skimming jacket. Small hats called cokes, like the one Diane wears, hug the head even in a high wind. Despite war clouds looming over Europe, in America it is a time of peace and optimism. We firmly believe that life will continue to become better for all of us as labor-saving inventions continue to make life easier. Our Diane, with her civic improvement clubs, has more important things to do than balance hats and make social calls. <laughs> By 1915, women's suffrage had become a burning and very controversial issue. Instead of staying at home where they belonged, women gave speeches, held rallies, paraded for the right to vote, and generally made nuisances of themselves in the state legislatures and even in the sacred halls of Congress. Mary Dudley models a suffragette's hat. It's a no-nonsense, deep crown hat, rather unflattering, you might admit. But it befits the suffragette's many challenges and her serious purpose. She certainly was more interested in winning the right to vote than in being named best, best dressed woman of the year. The needs of a country at war strengthened the suffragette's movement as women showed themselves able and willing to fill in for men absent in the services. They sold liberty bonds, worked in factories, and farms, and some drove ambulances in France. There could be no more claim that women were incapable physically, mentally, or emotionally of assuming the responsibilities of choosing our country's leaders. Right on, right on, Mary Dudley. We'll vote for that. The world of vaudeville didn't know it yet, but its days were numbered. America was falling in love, not only with the jerky, flickering images shown on the silver screen, but with the performers, too. Mary Pickford, one of the first real movie stars, was America's sweetheart, and her style was copied by women all over the land. Diane's picture hat, with its soft, straw brim, open-work crown, and spray of pale, pale pink flower, flowers, is pure Pickford in look and feel, and what a sweetheart she is in it. Because movies were seen in every corner of the country, simultaneously, they were instrumental in disseminating new trends in fashion. Even Europe found itself influenced by American movies, and because the American ready-to-wear industry was much further ahead than that of Europe, American women as a whole were much more fashionably dressed. We spent hours at the movies, laughing with Charlie Chaplin and the Keystone Cops, and crying with Mary Pickford and the Gish sisters. And Diane is well prepared with her pretty hanky. I hope she has a few more in reserve. We hadn't 
really started roaring in 1922. But the shape of things to come was apparent as hem lines rose, hip lines failed, fell, and graceful face framing fabric hats with wire rims came into vogue. Mary Dudley's brown satin picture hat, trimmed with feathers, takes a saucy tilt as she surveys the modern scene. Women have the vote. They have more and more modern electric appliances in their up-to-date homes. She undoubtedly has an electric range and a refrigerator in the kitchen and a ringer washer in the basement to lighten the housekeeping chores. And maybe there is a crystal set in the living room to entertain her and bring the world into her home. She may even find, find time to read a steamy True Confessions magazine, which she keeps hidden under the big green <laughs> back chair. With Henry Ford turning out those marvelous Model T's, they have a mobility never before known. You just crank her up and let her roll. Or if you're smart like Mary Dudley, you get someone else to do the cranking. Now. The economy was booming, and with jazz bands wailing and bootleg hoops flowing, the mood was loose and free. Clothing, too, was loose and free, with skirts up to the knee, waistlines down to the hips, and bosoms totally outlawed. The shape of the 20s was no shape at all. Diane shows us the must-have of the era. The cloche worn like helmet over short, shingled hair. Her hat and her shoes are the only tight garments she wears. The woman of the 20s worships youth, and she would rather be a casual and light-hearted companion than a traditional wife and mother. She prefers cocktail parties to tea dances. She smokes openly and slang, and even stronger words have become part of her vocabulary. Things that aren't swell and grand are probably lousy. <laughs> she probably had her hair shingled in the neighborhood barber shop, as beauty parlors were still few and far between. Men weren't all that sure they liked their male bastions invaded, and they wondered if the pool hall would be next. I don't know, Diane. You wear a mean lipstick. Lipstick, how are you with a pool? Good, I hope. When Mary Dudley, our flaming flapper, went out on the town for an evening, she left her clothes at home and tied on her feather or jewel trimmed hairband, dubbed the headache band. It added the absolutely perfect touch to a little beaded Georgia dance bra. Other necessary accessories were a long, knotted rope of pearls, dangling earrings, and a mar marvelously fluffy boa. Her flap, our flapper rolled her sheer silk stockings to the knee over her freshly shaved legs, and what a flap that cost. Who ever dreamed of women shaving their legs? And she donned high heels, she rouged her lips, her cheeks, and even her knees, where the knees were particularly prominent when she danced to Charleston. Pity poor old mom and dad trying to cope with a teenage daughter in a world as remote from the one they grew up in as the dark ages their daughter believes them to have lived in. They've heard all too many stories of what goes on in the back seats of those cars where the river snappers always seem to have available. And by the way, if you haven't looked into the back seat of an old car recently, let me assure you that you would be amazed at just how much room there was back <laughs> 23 skidoo, Mary Dudley. You are the bee's knees. The early 30s 
brought the Great Depression, the New Deal, FDR's fireside chats, talking movies, longer skirts, bias cut gowns, Marcel hair, and small brim hats like this vanilla straw. Diane gives her hat a bit of a Johnny tilt over the eye. A little bit of Johnniness did wonders for our spirits in those dark days. The fashion silhouette was a softer, more feminine one, and bosoms and waistlines became popular once more. There were many <laughs> hat styles popular in the 30s, but the small hat on a closely Marcel head best evokes the early years of the Great Depression. Love, love and marriage, rose-covered cottages, and baby, baby carriages were yearned for by young people of the 30s. But between wish and fulfillment, there were a lot of obstacles. A young man needed a steady paycheck because there were no jobs for married women. Many young couples started married life in parents' homes, and the resulting tensions and arguments voted poorly for marital bliss. But in the marriage rate and birth rate tumbled, the divorce rate took a nosedive. No one could afford to divorce. So couples remain together literally, for better or for worse. Aha, those were the days when Shirley Temple was the darling of the movies and everyone drank whole team with little orphan Annie. Cheers, Diane. The movies provided an inexpensive escape from the realities of the Depression, and movie stars became our fashion setters and our role models. In our fantasies, we too could be rich, beautiful, and surrounded by handsome men. One movie star who really captured our imaginations and our hearts was the mysterious Greta Garbo. Her famous statement, I want to be alone, became a national, <laughs> national catchphrase, and copies of her face-hiding slouch hats were eagerly worn by every fashion-conscious woman in 1935. Times were still hard in 1935, and many a family survived only because a whole alphabet soup of government agencies had been hastily contrived to put the un unemployed to work. The CCC gave work and direction to the lives of hopeless young men as they built fire roads and planted trees in overcut forests. The AAA not only saved many a farmer from bankruptcy, but also developed new construction techniques. Mary Dudley shows us a garbled slouch which certainly succeeds in hiding the face. Perhaps she hasn't heard that listering promises to prevent that dread social malady, paraposis, or that I can will give her a dazzling smile of beauty. Or maybe Mary Dudley simply prefers to remain a lady of mystery. <laughs> <laughs> In December 1941, America went to war. Women were left to shoulder the burdens of the home front, and so the heavy square shoulder pad was invented to help them carry the load. Diane wears one of the very small, very chic, early 40s hats, which complemented the broad-shouldered silhouette. It was worn tilted over the eye, just like the hat of the 1870s, and it was often trimmed with veils, feathers, flowers, and bowls. Movie stars like Rita Hayworth and Anne Sheridan made this type of hat very popular. Whimsical hats like this were worn when the music of Glenn Miller and the other big bands filled the airways, and when women volunteered for the Red Cross, 
built P-17 bombers and danced all night in USO canteens. The Second World War seemed to go on forever. Our men were gone, but home front morale had to be maintained. So despite clothing shortages and rationed shoes, we dressed. After all, he might get a leave. Meat, canned goods, and coffee were also rationed, and gasoline was severely curtailed, with most families limited to four gallons a week. We saved grease and cooking fats to make soap, collected scrap metal, and bought war bonds. With such a demanding schedule, Diane, I certainly hope that you're eating your readings. There were other hats that were also very popular during the war, and they too perched on the front of the head or over the eye. Mary Dudley has heard her country's call, and she has joined the Air Force. While Diane tries a jaunty Navy nurse's cap on for size. Presidential debate, 
We had overcome at least one of our prejudices enough to elect the first Catholic president in our history, and we elected the youngest man ever to sit in the Oval Office. Before rock and roll, the twist and the pants suit arrived in the 1960s, Jacqueline Kennedy was setting America's style. Fashion declared the headline to be a look below the knee. The empire she dressed with an A-line skirt made its appearance along with the pillbox hat worn on the back of the head. Diane's feather-trimmed hat is a perfect example. Then along came the beehive hairdo. No hat ever made could perch atop that teased and lacquered tower of hair. And so the hat disappeared for more than 40 years. Today, you occasionally see a woman suited and hatted, and doesn't she look wonderful? Three cheers for that. This concludes our look at 100 years of changing hat fashions. At this time, I would like to introduce our models. Mary Dudley on the left. Name Mary Dudley Alfonso and Diane. Diane playing the piano today for us, playing theory of music, is Jack Davis. We hope that you have enjoyed our trip down memory lane and thank you for your goodwill.
it, um, Toby Jones actually owned the property originally. Oh, really? And uh, that's one reason why Point Defiance Village can't have uh, assisted living. It can only be in retirement. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, they stretch the rules a lot where people have children in assisted living. Yeah. But we're going back into retirement. Probably we have run a lease, so we can't do it till the first of October. Thank you. We're going to go that to Willow Gardens, which is off, off of Meridian. <laughs> well, we were originally living in the retirement. Okay.